Wednesday, Keely Dunn, FH Umpires, you're the third team, and that is just the beginning. Uh, welcome. We are doing a very uh, different show today in recapping our experiences at the EHCO Trophy and EHL as an FHU third team. So I'm glad you're all here, and I'm really looking forward to all the questions, the bants, the memories and all the such things. So let's let's get started. Let me do the, the flashy topic thing just because it's what anchors me in every show. So here we go. We're going to be talking about our EHCO trophy, trophy debrief, trophy, <laughs> EHL impressions from whatever we saw of it. We've got a Europa, <laughs> I give up, a Europa Cup flashback. And then we do have an EHL clip that we're going to talk about. And I'm going to be doing that with some of my favorite people because it's been uh, a week, a week and a little bit since I got home and I miss them so much. I thought I was going to bring them on the show, but I'm going to do that in just a little bit. There's a couple things that I just wanted to talk about before we got started, because first of all, you know that what I always have to do is give a thank you, a shout out, Robert Turnbull from Australia. Thank you very much, sir. You have joined FHU 3T Green, and I really appreciate it. I don't know what's happening with my graphics today. Things things are a little wonky in the old graphic land. Okay, let me try that again. Is it gonna work this time? I don't know. It's just... <laughs> Our celebrations are a little less than celebratory today, which is awkward because there was something that was pointed out to me on the server in the yellow chat, which I kind of didn't really process until it happened that Elle got her beta or beta, depending on what area of the world you're in, testing. And wait, if I press the, it's just not gonna work, is it? Oh my goodness. She got her happy, Congratulations, year annual renewal of her beta testing yellow membership, which means that we are now officially three years, 
into the launch. It's been three years since I launched the FH Empires third team. And um, yeah, I, I gotta say that it, whoops, that's, that's really great. Let me just take that off the screen. Hi. Um, I, I, I'm gonna confess something it, that is really hard for me, but I had a really big cry about this this morning when I realized just what had happened. And I've talked about how, you know, so many thousand subscribers on YouTube or however many followers on Twitter. And I'm like, hey, here's numbers. But it hasn't really just, it doesn't really mean a lot to me. But the third anniversary of FH Umpires as a umpiring academy, as a team, as a community means everything to me. And I was really surprised at how hard it hit me about how far we've come. So this show today is a really nice sort of encapsulation, encapsulation of everything we've gone through and how far we've come and just how proud I am of myself, to be honest, for having the courage to, to do this and to try it and have the audacity to ask people to give me money to help teach them umpiring <laughs> and just continuing to put myself out on the internet all the time. And the fact that you all have come along for the ride and you've been there and you've been supporting me, it just means everything. So if I look a little bit puffy, it's because I had a big cry about it, but it was a happy cry. So there you go. Going to say hi to a few people who especially, you know, canceled training to come out for this. Sebastian, Saint Sebastian, as I like to call him now. Thank you so much for being here and for everything you did last week. And we're going to be getting into that, I'm sure. William, I know you're, you're feeling the envies right now. Uh, boy, I'm having trouble with Ecamm today. Uh, don't worry. We're going to do more of that. We're going to we're going to do more tours. So it's, this is not the only chance that you're ever going to have to join in. Andrew, good to see you and Stain, very nice. And yeah, it was a, it was a ridiculous start. We'll, we'll tell that story in a second. Yes, he was polishing the dome and having good fun at my expense. So not mad at that whatsoever. Good to see you, Scott and Mr. Roy Firemaster. Hi, <laughs> Reggie's here. Of course, we've got a few people. I'm not even going to do that. And yes, I went back to the old song. I had to. I had to just for this one. There you go. And yeah, I think God has broke my graphics too. That's a good point. I, sh I should never do that again. Um, let's see. We, <laughs> we left out all our processing power at uh, AHBC. That makes sense. Yeah, Rachel, next time you're going to be with us for sure. That's going to be awesome. And yes, thank you very much. Nine nine is in the house. There you go. And happy birthday. Okay, so I actually managed to get through that faster than I thought. So that's the good news. We are going to move on to start our debrief. Everybody's in position, I think. And let's see if I press the right buttons and everything happens because I'm about to bring on my panel of esteemed guests to do our EHCO Trophy debrief. Please, welcome to the stage. Goddard's and Kat and Mike McDowell. Welcome, how are you guys doing today? Good, good. we're all good. 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 We're all good. <laughs> Remember that part where I wrote in the notes that you guys have to just talk over each other? I meant it. You really just do have to talk over each other and all this sort of thing. So there you go. Thanks for agreeing to come on and, and have a chat and share all the things that we did together and all the inside jokes. No, I'm just kidding. You can't, you can't talk about all those things. Of course we so. can. We have to. <laughs> I didn't prepare the graphics. I don't have the, I don't have the, the sign of all the out of context quotes, unfortunately. So there you go. So um how about we go around the the scene and tell me about um how you were involved in the tour because each of you had kind of different roles and helped in different ways 
And, and I'm talking about, especially for Cat and Mike, I'm talking about the lead up as well. That's really important. I want people to know how much work you guys put in uh, leading up to things. So how about I start with Mike right next to me? Look at that. I did it the right way. Uh, introduce yourself for anybody out there in internet land who may not know you and talk about what you did for the tour. Hi, uh, so I'm Mike Mack. So um, one of the moderators on the FHU Discord. We have a Discord server, if you didn't know that. Uh, so my role was uh, with the organization. Um, I helped Keely with putting together the pre, uh, so the uh, like umpire development activities that we did over the course of the week. And then uh, I was one of the umpires at EHCO. So uh, just on the organizational side, just helping Keely and Kat out so that we had everything in place for everyone, making sure the hotels were booked the transportation was booked everything was paid for um yes and cat because cat did a lot yeah yeah like, well i we'll, don't want to we'll, underemphasize we'll... how much cat did like cat did cat did so much yeah we will we um, will get to her in a moment too but mike i i do want to say you know getting into it i want to express my appreciation for all the work that you did do i kept pulling you into little meetings and be like hey can you come help me with this spreadsheet and this financial thing because look i've got a mind for arguments and words and not for numbers at this moment so you helping me out with the financial side of things especially was really really helpful so thank you so much especially and spreadsheets huh? yeah yeah spreadsheets they're they're not my thing uh cat let's let's go to you tell everybody and if you leave anything out you know we're coming after you and we're gonna say it for you so <laughs> talk about what you did in getting all this together. Hi, um, <laughs> Kat, resident alcoholic. No, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> so I was a team manager. I did a lot of the um, just planning, hotel bookings and running around and driving and uh, delivering of kits and things like that. Um, I was also one of the journalists <laughs> at uh, EHL, but uh, I kind of rubbed in the EHCO for that as well. And I was also an umpire for the EHCO, which was super fun, probably my favorite part. Um, also a moderator on the Discord. Did you know we had Discord? Yeah. Um, I think that's it. I don't think I left anything out. <laughs> Yeah, maybe, except I think people really need to know, aside from people like Simon Milford and Godders and a few others, Kat was really one of the catalysts for this whole thing happening. If it wasn't for the fact that she was on the ground in Amsterdam and able to make all the connections, and honestly, she had no fear if there was ever... Uh, a hotel that needed to get called and reminded if she needed to break some knees to make sure that somebody's deposit came in or, you know, whatever the job needed doing that needed a little bit of, of courage and just some get up and go, Kat was there doing it. So I, I like the whole FHE third team owes a ton to you for that. And I'm really excited about all the things that we're going to be doing in the future, which is going to be really awesome. So Thank you for all of that. I had that. a lot of fun. And you had a lot of fun. Good. That's good to hear. Goddard's, take it away. Tell us about how you were involved in the EHCO and the development tour. Uh, professional dancer, number one. <laughs> <coughs> Media manager, so in charge of photography, tweets and LinkedIn and uh, Instagram posts. And assistant to the great Keely Dunn in terms of umpire management and um, generally just keeping everyone's spirits high I think not that they needed to be kept high and just the occasional uh, beer just to keep me really yeah, chief beer drinker <laughs> goddess yeah, yeah. making sure that I got in all the time so that we did finish late on a few occasions the scheduling was very which we can talk about later I think a fantastic event yeah awesome yeah it was so that was one of the interesting things and for those of you who don't know how this whole 
EHCO trophy came about and, and where it came from, it honestly, we had decided as a group that we were going to go to the EHL and tour, right? And it was going to be just a development thing. We were going to enjoy watching all the matches and we were going to um, do some umpiring exercises and work our minds a little bit and then work our, you know, beer drinking arms a little bit. And three weeks before the tournament, uh, I got a note from a friend, uh, Ernst Bart, who I've done uh, other streams with. And he said, oh, you're going to be getting a, a note, a, a message from Sander Vanderveet, who I'm, I know I'm saying his name incorrectly. I really apologize. But he is a one of the most decorated hockey players in Dutch uh, national team history. And uh he's he's going to be sending you a note about whether you can help support the ehco trophy now that's the european hockey club associations uh organizations and what they're trying to do is help bolster the european club competitive system and sort of work underneath the ehl as as a um, as a supporter and provide competitive opportunities for other clubs that aren't in that just top pinnacle of of european club hockey which i thought was really cool and so you know at first sander was asking and cat cat was in on the meetings as well that you know at first it was you know hey do you have a couple of umpires and i said sure how many do you need and and they were like oh we'll get back to you and the next meeting was can you just bring all of your umpires and do all of the matches and i said okay sure so how about you know, I, I want to make sure that I, I still work with these people because they're very important to me. And this is the whole reason that we're going. So can I work with your umpire manager? Oh, do you want to be the umpire manager? And I was like, okay, sure. And then I said, okay. And then your match officials, you know, we'll need to coordinate with them and, you know, and, and Fabrizio, who is the, the TD, you know, I'll need to, to work with them closely. And he said, do you have match officials that you can provide? <laughs> and so we ended up just by sheer accident over the course of three weeks, basically shifting what was going to be purely a development exercise to actually participating in this incredible European competition. <laughs> and it just, it just fell into our lap. So I want to know from you guys, when I started talking to you all about Hey, do you want to umpire? Do you want to help with this? Do you want to help with that? How did you, how did you feel when all that was coming about? And did you have any concerns about how it was going to affect the whole notion of going on an EHL tour? Maybe we'll start with Goddard's first and, and go back around. Well, having been to EHL various times, whether in Belgium or in Holland before, etc., cetera, the, the actually uh, EHL is fantastic. So I wanted to see some of that. And as it happens, we, we did see a bit in the mornings, but the EHCO just took over. But it was it was fantastic um, opportunity, and I think we got the best of both worlds because we committed to what we were doing. But in the spare time, we were able to see um, some of the best umpires in Europe um, doing their stuff. Um, some better than others, and some and really recognising it as well that they make mistakes and that they um, do annoy players and things like that. So there was nothing particularly unusual around that, but it was the best of both worlds, I think. Really know what to expect in terms of the standard of play. I thought yeah. it'd be good, but it was actually very, very good. Um, and I wasn't quite sure, because I didn't know all of the umpires, how I, I sort of trusted you would know. The, the, and the match of the umpires with the play was it was extremely good. It worked quite nicely. I think the, the levels were, were perfect for what we needed. Yeah, uh, thanks. And that, that's a good point because I think anytime, and you have a ton of umpire magic experience, Goddard, so you, you know what it's like that, you know, you might show up to a tournament, you might know some of the people, you might know some of the teams, but maybe you've got people that you haven't seen before and you don't know how they're going to work. You don't know what their teamwork is like, what their experience levels are, what their most recent experiences have been. And, and you have to sort of try to, try to communicate and set people up for success and try to put people in positions where you know that they're going to be able to serve the games really well and still stretch them 
a little bit so that they can grow and, and be challenged and, you know, have confidence in them. But a lot of it is just trying to, you know, put those pieces together in a way that you think, okay, this is going to serve the ultimate goal and the ultimate purpose. And I know you feel strongly about this too, Goddess, that it's about making sure that the matches go really, really well. What was quite interesting was as well was the unity of the team because obviously everyone wants to do their best individually but the actual um, seeing all the umpires wanting everyone else to succeed very well so sometimes you get into positions where there's a lot of ego going around but I have to say the group were fantastic and very supportive and, and the other thing for me was as well is how brilliant the match official teams are and how difficult it is and how they got up to scratch with that straight away and and I'm sure that all the umpires really appreciated that as well because they oh, were fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. It was really interesting because I did have a conversation with Leandro. Um, so Leandro Martinez is the president of the EHCO. And between himself and Sander and Fabrizio, they were sort of the three musketeers who were in charge of the whole escapade. And, and he mentioned to me uh, about halfway through the tournament, he said, I have never experienced a tournament where the umpires and the match officials were so, so close. Like you were just one team and it was really nice watching you all work. And it's why the matches went so smoothly in, in his estimation. And for, for a, a retired player and somebody who hasn't participated in any of those sort of spheres before, I think that was a really cool observation that he was able to pick up on that and see how well everybody worked. And honestly, that was the thing that really jumped out at me and that I'm, I'm just so grateful for is that, you know, it wasn't the right place for everybody to umpire, but everybody could contribute in one way or another. And for those people who stepped up to be match officials, which was everybody other than <laughs> like the whole team was involved, that made, that made the tournament because all the administrative stuff was taken care of and we didn't have to worry about rosters and weird subs and not getting match sheets signed and not knowing what the score was after the game or who had yellow cards. I mean, everybody was just amazing. And it really brought about more of an appreciation for me, somebody who's always thought really highly of match officials, but all of a sudden I really saw how important they were and I loved that. I loved how close we worked together. And that was really super fun. So Kat, why don't you talk about, you know, your sort of feelings about having all of a sudden this was going to be uh, an actual umpiring experience rather than just uh, a watching tour. Yeah, look, I, I was already under quite a bit of positive pressure. Um, because I, it was the first time I had uh, been given, um, you know, the, the reins and, and, and sort of a chance to organize things uh, head on. Um, it's obviously always an honor when, when you know, someone, someone you, you care about and respect gives you um, responsibility. So I, I really enjoyed that. But uh, when, when the EHCO news came about, I was... I can't tell you how excited it was. I was like a, a child, you know, on, on, on Christmas Day because this is exactly what I always pictured um, FHU doing. It's what I always pictured, uh, you know, uh, you providing uh, for hockey. And it was, it went so well. I, I was like, I knew, I saw this. I, I knew it was going to happen. But personally, I was a bit concerned uh, just how I was going to manage my time as well, just, uh, just because of the journalism uh, side of it and the fact that I was there for Hockey World News as well and um, and how much time I was going to put into to the EHL from that perspective um, and then I also wanted to get as much as I could as an umpire so I had to juggle the management and the umpiring brain and the journalism brain and the friendship brain um, it was very exhausting but uh, in the best kind of way um, I think the team, the team just did so well, and it, it was exactly the way I pictured it to be. Um, you know, everybody got along great, and uh, we learned so much from each other. And like, I mean, there is no other way for me to explain it except the fact that it's exactly how I pictured it to be, and this is exactly why 
I wanted FHU to to go in this direction. So yeah, yeah that that's how I felt about it. That, that's awesome. I and I think people at home really need to understand how you know Kat and I have been talking very closely and working together over the last few months, and pretty much right after we had that first contact with Sander, she said to me, "Well, obviously." Like, this is what's supposed to be happening. This is, this is what FH umpires should be doing. And I said, what do you mean? And so she told me about how, oh, you know, you should be going and bringing groups to tournaments and we should be umpiring as a touring group and we should be educating and, and doing all this stuff. And I just, my mind was blown because I, I hadn't in a million years thought about that as a, as, as an, a branch of FH umpires activity. So the fact that, somebody else in the community had a vision for what we could do together that was something you know bigger and greater and a hairier dream than I could even come up with I it was really amazing to me and it was one of those moments that taught me that it isn't this isn't about me this is about everybody and everything that you guys are putting into it and how you're pulling the community into whole new directions and all that sort of thing. So, so thank you for that. I, I really thought that was great. Um, Mike, tell me about uh, how this all I mean, <laughs> went I, together. <laughs> I think I was just like, yes, like, <laughs> let's go for it. Let's do as much as we can. I'll do as much as you need me to do as I can take on. Um, you know, I love watching hockey. I love umpiring just being around good hockey and the game and good people for me was going to be a massive thing anyway to, to meet up with a bunch of like-minded people, watch the hockey at the EHL. And then you were like, would you be interested in umpire? And I was like, yeah, like drop, drop everything else, drop sightseeing, you know, drop watching too much EHL hockey and take on umpiring watch some different some different level stuff and socialize with some people so you know from the minute that it was like this is an idea i'm floating this as an idea what do you think i was like i'm i'm sold absolutely sold so it was it was a fantastic week from arrival the organization side like it was great fun doing all the organization with you with cat with like like luke and simon and the match official guys and the uh dan and um Sebastian on the ground at Kampong, that was really great to do all that stuff, get them involved, setting it all up, and then it just ran like pretty much like clockwork. I think, you know, sometimes sometimes you think, you know, we, we joked at one point that you see all these big tournaments and big events and stuff, and the facade to the to the public is that everything runs smoothly, and and in reality, everything is just complete and utter chaos behind the scenes. But actually, I think everything went really smoothly behind the scenes. And that's a testament to, to the organization that, that everyone put in at the beginning and everyone bought into, yes, we're going to go and do this as a primary part of our reason to go into the Netherlands now, rather than something tacked on to watching the EHL. And I think it was all the better for that. Yeah, that that's a really good point. And you were one of those people when I, I was really worried about taking away from too much time from everybody's chances to watch EHL. Cause I mean, like, like you and Kat and I mean, Goddard's has seen EHL before, but I hadn't been there in person. I'd been to Wagner stadium, but I'd been there for pro league. I hadn't seen EHL in person and I had always dreamed of it. And I thought, man, like great opportunities, but I really do want to be able to see some EHL. And for me, as soon as the opportunity came up, I mean, obviously from my position of responsibility, I was like, yeah, I don't care if I see a single EHL game, that'll be for the future. But I wanted to make sure other people saw it. And you were one of those people who said, I will do every game. You do, you put me in anything and I will do every game. And I was just like, okay, great. I that think, was, I think yeah. it was it was a great opportunity to, to get upfront feedback from you and upfront feedback from Goddard. You're never gonna be able to replicate that just by watching and as and as good as having the feedback on on watching is having the people to give you that feedback is is, is even better right don't mind me i have to fix a couple things here but there we go i'll put mike in the proper slot and i'll put cat here and everything will be fine there we go 
I thought I'd just start the slideshow just so that people can see. And Goddard's, this was, I, I, I'm a terrible photographer. Not that I don't know how to press the shutter button, but I just don't seem to ever remember to do it. And you, I know people tease you about how much you put up on social media sometimes, but you captured so many great shots and memories that um, I am so appreciative of. And I've got, I've got a folder full of, you know, 200 photos that I can look at and, you know, remember, oh, look at us there. And I, I, I just really appreciate you doing all that and, and your habit of just knowing I need to take a picture of every single umpiring pair, you know, everybody, um, I need to capture them and it really meant a lot. So thank you for doing all that. Um, how, how did it feel for you to be in that position of, uh, sort of, you know, helping with the umpire managing and working with umpires that you hadn't seen before and sort of capturing all these moments. What, what do you think you maybe learned the most from out of all these experiences? It's quite interesting because I've been to um, tournaments as a coach of my, my team at Fair and at playoffs and things like that. I've been involved as an umpire in high, high, relatively high level tournaments over three days as an umpire. But to do it as the um, assistant UM stroke coach of the umpires was really uplifting because when you're in it for, um, for yourself as an umpire, you're very much focused on your own performance. And this was very much focused around making sure everyone else got the, the most out of it they could. And I think I only missed one game out of all of the games that were played. Um, so I saw every game apart from one that the umpires got involved in. What was really, really good was how everyone grew. They overcame adversity at times and some some issues. The, the, the growth of umpires, you could see that they were learning, uh, but everyone wanted to help everyone else. Um, so I learned an awful lot. I learned a lot from you, particularly around um, debrief presentation, the use of, um, I'd like to use more of the um, listening to what the umpires are saying to themselves across technology. I thought that was excellent. Um, and I, I guess the only downside really was the fact that because we were so had so many games to cover and umpires having to become reserves for other games, the scheduling, if we could have had the scheduling slightly better, it's not a criticism, just an observation. I think the debriefs could have been a little bit more structured, but we got mm -hmm. there in the end. Um, and as well, everybody was keen to learn and keen to listen. Um, not saying they listened to every all the bits of nonsense I say, but like anything, you can pick the bones out of it. But you could see how everybody um, really took stuff on board. And the big one for me was around when you're umpiring, and I'll take this into my umpire, where you've got all those, uh, the Germans, the Spanish, the Dutch, and that playing, how everybody adapted their management style to use more whistle, um, particularly, and more body language than voice, um, and to keep that into a much sharper um, perspective. Um, the weekend that got so much more sharp, um, and, we, and we got very few problems of where it was people don't understand what's happening here, or that you, and you can't talk to them because they don't understand. So people's body language and the way they approached it really changed over the course of the, of the four days. Yeah, that, that that's a really, opinion. yeah. Thank you, thank you for pointing that out. And, and Mike, I want to ask you a little bit more about that, about how, what it was like and what kind of, um, you know, shifts you made in your umpiring, having all of a sudden, you know, this experience of working with international teams. Uh, how how did you meet that challenge? I mean. It sort of had to meet it head on. Uh, game one for me was in Wagner Stadium with Amsterdam against uh, Royal Ori in front of a vociferous Amsterdam crowd. And to say sort of bricking it is maybe a, a slight understatement at that point. But, um, you know, Anwar and I did a really good prep and I basically just went into the game going, you're not going to be able to say anything. You're going to have to use your whistle. You're going to have to use your body language more and sort of a quarter into the match, it was like, oh, actually, this works. Like, not only does this work, it's easier than been doing previously. You don't need to say anything. You just be proactive, 
be proactive with your whistle and get players to do what you want them to do without being overbearing with the whistle and suddenly the game starts opening up and the players don't try and do silly things and they're not they're putting the ball in the right place because you've jumped on it had to use your voice it's just been a couple of quick peeps on the whistle and then and then you get on with it and it means that when you have got a lot of noise coming from my left hand side as i did from from the stadium and the players maybe can't hear what you're trying to say the whistle cuts through that much more easily than than your voice ever will um and then you don't have any problems with with management and that for me was a was a massive learning exercise and something that i tried to take into subsequent games and i know that you and god has picked me up in one of the games you like you've fallen back onto talking to the players too much probably because you've got comfortable and you're like just going through the motions a little bit and it's like actually what you were doing earlier was much better go back to that and uh, had a game with Cat and we we tried to pick that up and I think we did a pretty good job. So that for me was a was a big thing that I'm going to take forward of just use the whistle more, use your voice less because it's not necessary. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I I think that it, I certainly experienced that just in listening to the conversations and what communications you were having from the radios that we were using. So one of the challenges we had is that the XCV radios that we tried to use on the pitch did not work. They were uh, just, a, I, I don't want to say an abject failure, but um, it, there's just so much interference and the way that the frequencies that those radios are working on, um, I th we suspect it was all of the broadcast equipment around the stadium for the EHL and there's, I, you know, there were about 25 Wi-Fi networks that were all, you know, buzzing around and just so much in the air that the Xiwis just couldn't cut through any of that. We ended up uh, going to the, the Bluetooth motorbike radios, which I'm not a fan of, but at least they worked. But that meant that as an umpire coach, you know, Goddard's and I couldn't listen in and be participating because then we would be always on and and that facility just isn't available on those radios but luckily you had the idea mike that i could use the dji wireless mics that i had bought and brought over and we just attached them to you guys and then i was able to listen in and i recorded some of the matches actually on my phone i haven't listened to them back yet but they're they're there they're in the voice memos and I'll be able to put that over top of footage, you know, in, in other occasions and, and then be able to listen back to how your communications and, and share that with you guys, how what you've said at this point, you know, really, you know, really worked with that player, but didn't work with this person. And, and maybe if you'd said it this way, it would have been more clear and, and be able to give all that feedback. So the, the, the verbal communication is such an important part that we don't get access to on a regular basis and i'm really appreciative of the opportunity that we had at ehco to to dive into that and and, and really you know be a part of it cat what was one of the biggest things that you learned uh through the whole experience of the of the tournament what was what what really stood up for you well um, I must say, I think I have like pages and pages of, of big things that I learned, but, um, um, you know, on the topic of, of radios and, and, and so on, I've, I've always wondered, you know, to myself, uh, when I first started umpiring and all the way up until this tournament, honestly, uh, where people learn how to communicate the way they do on, on a radio during a match. And, you know, I would listen to... I would listen to like people, you know, wh while watching TV and listen to the umpires communicate with each other when, when there's a referral or whatever and, and be like, how are they so clear and concise? And I get so worked up during a match just explaining things to players. So how, how, do, how do they learn to, to use radio so effectively? And I, f I felt that uh, I was able to do that. Um, and, and, you know, the fact that you could hear us and, and, uh, that we knew you could hear us. It, it didn't feel it didn't feel too intense it, the way I expected it to be. It felt it felt a lot. It felt like I could oh I I, I got lost there, but I I know that you know I could get advice because she heard exactly what I said. I don't have to like retell the story. Um, so that's one of the things is that I I think I really learned um, what what works for me and what works for different partners. And I had games where um, it didn't quite work, and uh, there was a bit too much. Talk um 
you know, I was distracted or, or, or stressed out during a match. Um, but then there were there were matches that 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 improved significantly and, and made a huge difference um, to how I was umpiring as well. So the communication part was was a huge thing. And then, of course, just little, um, you know, like high level hockey tweaks uh, that you only get in your umpiring through having an umpire manager there and having more than just one or two games to umpire in in you know the space of a week or, or five days or whatever it was that we had um you know like uh like mike said you you can't really replace that it's um it's something you you don't just get from from one one game and one person showing up and then another person showing up to a different game so i thought having just having a um again and the fact that it was you and uh we were able to have conversations and really delve into things uh, judgment free um and dissect things that i've been wanting to dissect for the longest time so i i felt like uh, all in all i learned a lot but communication um you know with with a colleague through a radio and with players was a huge thing um the fact that you could hear me speak to the players was a big thing as well for me so um that was probably one of the biggest ones too is just chatting to players and 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 uh that for me improved significantly um you know from start to finish yeah awesome I just want to remind everybody who's who's watching that if you have any questions for anybody about the whole experience or you want to find out more, you know, make sure you put it in the comments because I'm I'm watching them and I'll bring them up. And uh, if you want to quiz more on, you know, what it's like for Kat to umpire with a giant or anything like that, you know, please go ahead and 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 ask away. But I want to pick up on something that you um, that you mentioned and, and put that to, to Goddard's is that you talked about how it's tweaks and how higher level hockey, it's, it doesn't involve a complete revamping of what you do, or it's not a massive leap, but it's tweaks of very, very small things that make the difference between being okay or being really good at that level. Goddard's, what were the things that you really noticed in the team and, and the, the umpires who went out there, what kind of tweaks did you see them changing in order to meet the challenge of umpiring at that level? I think in overview was the thing that struck me as well is that we had a very, very detailed technical briefing before we started about what was going on in terms of umpiring and that was the ownership of that sat with the umpires broadly, although we were saying these are the parameters each of the umpires or were asked to present on different parts of it, little subjects and things like that, whether it's the um, the overheads, how they're going to be brown, whether it's cards and things like that, management of the game. And what was really, really good is the fact that in broad terms, what we said we we're going to do, we delivered. So that is the big tick any time you you go to a tournament. In terms of what I saw that changed, apart from the one we've spoken about, which was with regard to um, use of more whistle, less less voice generally, was how well we're working very hard with MCP. Um, that people were buying into that very much. That it is a structure, but you still have to be adaptable to the game as it as it evolves. So in certain circumstances, you would go slightly different to, do, to achieve something else. Some of those conversations and some of the video that I use and things like that are really helpful just to say, well, on that occasion, and I remember Mike had one where he just had to leg it back and he couldn't, he had to turn and run like Billy O. And we were, we were saying that it's about the game. And in that situation, it was the right thing to do was to get out of there pretty damn quick. And they, they, it's not a perfect science. And it's not. So I think we learned a lot about the fact that you, reading the game, anticipation, and people are doing that. Slight tweaks again to people's management structure around um, around cards, um, taking those opportunities, not missing them, but balancing it up. Um, they were the major things I would say, and also just the the difference between when you're delivering a message with your colleague, when you're trying to work with your colleague, is to get rid of some of the chat which is about explaining the decisions you've already made it's more about 
where we're going next with what we're trying to do. So the impact of the ball that's made, what we're going to do about that next rather than a reflective conversation. It's very much a progressive conversation. Right. And yeah. I think people start starting to get that as well. And I think they're, they're the key elements for me. Yeah. I think the no. big theme of the week for me was was proactivity and everything. And, and like, even from a positioning perspective, what Goddard has just talked about and being proactive with saying to your colleague, I'm not going to be watching for the next two or three seconds because I need to be moving. You've got to play or I don't have a good view on the ball right now. Do you? Do I need to move? Like, obviously not in that amount of words, but being able to say, I don't have it right now. Okay, now I do have it. Meant that we got the right decisions the vast majority of the time. And the the what I guess we, you, what you would call the typically supporting umpire could potentially get into a better position to sell a decision in a in an unorthodox part of the pitch because they knew that their colleague was maybe unsighted for a minute and therefore they had to make adjustments to their position to sell a potential decision on on an area of the pitch and that to me was the big leap to to not be talking through the game about oh it's yours it's mine it's yours it's mine but just to say i don't have it or i'm getting on my bike or whatever it needed to let your colleague know that they might have to jump in and help at that point yeah yeah that was awesome and that was something that really evolved with all of you and i i don't I don't even really think maybe Goddard's you you were specific with them and you gave them this advice. I don't think I I broached it quite specifically, but the conversations that you started having, the exchanges where I'm going, do you have backside? I've got front side over here. I'm over top. I'm in behind. Those those touches that you really as a team, all of you started evolving that as a practice. And it was really cool to hear that because I talk a lot about fluidity of responsibility and how it's not about a line that you draw across a diagram of, of the field and you've got this side of the line and, and your colleague has the other side. It, it, umpiring doesn't work that way anymore. Maybe it never did, but it certainly doesn't work that way now. And you all as a group really evolved that and improved that as you, as you went along in the games. And it, yeah, it, I think it really, really made a difference with that. There's a question here from Shane. Uh, he says, for anyone to answer, how did you handle communication when the team or captain wanted to question a call? Kat, do you want to start us off with that? Because yeah, you had absolutely. a few of those moments. Um, yeah, yeah. So I, um, firstly, I, I, I think it's important to point out um, these players did speak basic English. Better think, English than uh, Keely. Just... Hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and no, I think uh, some of them um, struggled more than others. So, like the the Spanish team um, captain was uh, had a little bit less English experience than than the other teams. But generally speaking, everybody spoke a bit of English enough to sort of get their points across. Um, and for me, uh, it it was a case of having which I learned to do better throughout the tournament, but just letting them have their say and. And, and, and responding and then and then moving on with the game. Um, but yeah, in terms of the language barrier, it was, it was a case of uh, most of them knowing how to speak uh, basic enough English to communicate what they needed. Yeah, absolutely. Mike, how did you experience that? I think it emphasized the importance of being able to use your body language to explain a decision either in the moment or potentially after the fact but i think a lot of the explanation that we did was in the moment with body language which meant we didn't get lots of questions about individual decisions the questions were about you know why have you given a pc for this particular offense or i don't agree with the interpretation or i don't agree with what happened and it was a short conversation i guess usually in english because as cat said their english was pretty good but we eliminated a lot of the the low level questioning of decision just by selling it with the body language and then giving a signal. And I did find myself giving more signals for things like obstruction um, and danger than I would typically give I'm playing in the UK when I probably wouldn't do anything and I'd wait for that questioning look and then say it's obstruction or whatever it, whatever the offense is. But actually being proactive with that physicality and body language was made it much easier to umpire. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, I had a bit of an experience on the last day uh, because we did, we keep men mentioning the Spanish team and the, the male team from uh, CD Terrassa was at one point in the tournament, a little bit of a, a difficult team to manage. They, they had a match where they lost in the last, what, 30 seconds by a single goal that was scored. And, and they were very emotional afterwards. And, you know, I had, I had a long conversation with the manager on the pitch about conduct and their feelings of unfairness. And it was not a very fun conversation to have, but it's one of those things that, you know, Goddard's has had to do this a lot, I'm sure too, where you're trying to, you're trying to stand your ground. You're trying to protect your people and your team, but also let them have their opportunity to, to say their bit and get it out. The next day, the manager from CD Terrassa did come to me and apologized for how the entire group and especially herself had, had expressed their emotions. And then on the last day during the final, CD Terrassa was not in the final, but they were sitting up in the Amsterdam clubhouse and they had gathered in sort of behind me where I, where I was sitting watching the games and, and uh, Goddard, you know, gave me a lot of stick for staying in the clubhouse while I was watching the games instead of being out in the rain. But first of all, I was listening to the matches on the radios. But the second thing was I was sitting with that team for a reason because I had the opportunity to build rapport with 15 or so young men who are many of whom are probably going to play for the national team play for the senior teams play for other teams in uh, club teams in spain and i wanted them to put a face on umpiring and a presence on it and you know i'm i'm not always the the best representative but i do try to be personable i do try to start conversations and i was even explaining to the coaches who were sitting on on you know sort of off my shoulder here uh, I, I could hear them in Spanish asking about a couple decisions. And I said, oh, the umpires did this. And they said, how do you know? And I was like, well, I'm listening to them. And they said, what? You're listening? And you're hearing what they're saying on the pitch? And I said, yeah, I'm listening to everything that's happening. I can hear the players talking to them. I can sometimes hear them. The coaches are yelling at them. And they were gobsmacked. They had no idea that we would use technology like that as a as a coaching method and that we were working that hard on things like communication and giving feedback and trying to improve on those things. That is one of those elements of a tournament that you need to seize as a leader in a community to say, I can build a relationship with players who are now going to go home and go, Hey, you know, maybe umpires are actually trying to do their best and aren't out there just to ruin our days. And, and they're, they're improving and they're coaching and they're, they're, they're doing all this work. And there was this weird lady from Canada, like, I don't know what she was talking about, but she was kind of okay. And, and just being able to, to just chip away at that feeling of, of that barrier between us and the players and the coaches, those opportunities have to be taken and tournaments are exactly where you can really do a lot of that work. Did you get a chance to have any conversations with people, Goddard's in, in that respect uh, around the tournament? Yeah, I did. And I think the interesting thing is we all started as strangers. So normally you're umpiring in your domestic leagues and you get to see the teams quite often and they get to know how you umpire. How, and if you're the if you're the umpire coach, they'll say to you, they'll, they know what this umpire does, etc., etc. Here we started with a sort of like a clean slate. For most mm -hmm. of the umpires have not seen the teams before, the teams haven't seen the umpires. And you, over the three or four days, you're going to see them again. So what was really good was the fact that those rapports were built and people were saying, oh, I remember how you, you know, how that was blown, how that was blown. And it, that's the benefit of tournament hockey for me, is you get that opportunity to get out there and to do those things immediately be able to go back the next day and say show them you know if there was something they didn't agree with you can work through it and get, get out there and a lot of the conversations um because yeah if you say there's some um interesting and volatile um observations the coaches are quite near where sometimes i'm watching and all the rest of them and you just smile at them have a little chat with them afterwards but it actually was very very positive as opposed to and it became less 
it wasn't about the result related. The one issue was obviously you're going to be disappointed when you've conceded in the last 30 seconds and lost 1 0. Most of the games, the conversations afterwards were about slight nuances, maybe to um, how things are blown by different umpires, maybe from different countries and things like that. And or I suspect some of these clubs may not have had umpiring of that quality before. And so I think it's also important. Sorry to interrupt you, Goddess. Uh, you know, I think it's also important to note that, um, and I probably speak for everybody, but especially myself, we learned a lot from that team, and especially um, like uh, with Terasa, I, my management went from zero to hero in in those matches, and it, you know, I I I was embarrassed in some of the moments, some of the calls that I made, I wasn't proud of. Um, but I got the opportunity to fix it. And they, they gave me as much as they were reacting out of passion and emotion, but they were also reacting to things that I was saying and the things that I did right. And, um, you know, I didn't always get a reaction, good or bad, out of the other teams. Uh, not to say that they didn't do well or anything like that, but um, I, I learned the most from Terrassa. So um, I, I won't forget those young men, you know, no matter no matter the how much yelling there was, I learned the most from them. So. And we did learn very important swear words. That's for sure. Um, <laughs> yep. Really good question. Oh, sorry, Gladys. The only thing quickly as well as that is to not underestimate the benefit we had from, for instance, standing on the sideline, talking with the umpires who weren't umpiring or being in the reserve there, stood there just watching the game where our colleagues were involved in them, just talking about things are going and not in a critical way, very much a positive way to or well, what would have happened there? What do you think about that? And all those conversations were adding to that store of knowledge that everyone's picking up. So it isn't necessarily just coaching the people that you were, were on the field. It's actually working with the rest of the team off the pitch um, in a different, slightly different nuanced way. And all those conversations were fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. And prepping as a reserve is super, super important. <laughs> As we found out, yes, indeed. Yeah, I think that that's kind of a fun point because a lot of us, when we're back home, we don't have the opportunity. We're we're not at events where reserve umpires are appointed, and I, I'm really. I, I don't think I, I had to make a decision about how I was going to do everything by international standard because it just comes automatically to me. I'm oh I'm in an international environment. We're doing this the right way, which meant I had assigned reserve umpires to every match. And lo and behold, unfortunately, L had a bit of a mishap and had to come out uh, in the last sort of seven and a half minutes of of her game. And there was Mike, you know, just ready to go and stepped in and ably took over the game and it, again it was seamless and the players and coaches and fans you know i mean obviously they knew something had happened and and it was really distressing for Elle and you know we're we're hoping she's she's doing much better but it it didn't disrupt the game it didn't mean that oh my gosh we can't do this how are we going to continue or anything like that so yeah that was a really <laughs> really nice nice part um, Tristan has a question here about changes between it, tournament regulations that are, say, international and local. So how did how did we as a group, you know, cope with the, the differences between those sort of things and what you're used to back home? Um, do you want to start I, with that? I Mike? think we lent on the match officials. Like mm. the biggest was 15 minute quarters stop time for penalty corners, and honestly, without Without the match officials timing the match, it would have been nearly impossible to manage. And it just meant you didn't have to think about it. And and that for me was, meant it was very, actually very close to, to umpiring back home because I didn't have to think about what I was doing with the clock at any point. Um, and we just had to, to rely on them managing the time and they were obviously centrally timing the, the quarters anyway. But all of the differences in in regulations, the 18 players, two goalkeepers, um, just just they handled all of that and allowed us to focus on the four 15 minute quarters and getting the decisions right on the field. And I think they need they need a massive amount of credit for that because it made umpiring about umpiring and not about having to manage the teams through a tournament, which for a lot of the teams was played under different conditions to probably what they play 
back home too. So it wasn't just us as an umpiring team that were learning a new set of regulations for the, or, uh, well, rules and different regulations for the tournament. It was the teams having to, to deal with that too. Yeah, absolutely. Kat, do you have anything to add to that? No, I, I, I just want to reiterate what Mike said. And, and yeah, the, the match officials made all the difference. Yeah, yeah, they were, they were yeah. amazing like flawless. I, I couldn't believe it. There were just no problems whatsoever. Goddard, did you have anything for that? Yeah. The other thing was the uh, absolute quality of the um, brief that we had when we realized on the final day that they needed an outcome. Well, in the, in the earlier games, they could have draws. And we, they have the I knew it brief. all along, Goddard. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a surprise to me, okay? But, but no, team put an awful lot into that as well in terms of suspended players all this other stuff and we had a really yeah. good conversation as it was it wasn't needed but the the deep level of detail to just adjust to make sure we were ready was fantastic and it also gave me a chance to show my dancing skills <laughs> so true oh my goodness that has to be the most enjoyable debrief a briefing that I've ever been a part of. I'm, I've never laughed so hard and um, the banter was just impeccable. So, and, but that is the first time I have ever been at a tournament that has had shootouts or, um, you know, any, any time I've been part of a shootout briefing and we didn't need it because the first thing I said about the shootout briefing, I said, first rule of shootouts is we don't have them because we get results. We don't get paid for overtime. And everybody took that really seriously. I'm just kidding. It's not like he did anything in, intentional, but um, that was that was really, really cool. I, I enjoyed that a lot. And yeah, I, I think that was sort of the fun part is that I, I just tried to do my part and do my job in, in prepping things. And I worked really closely with Goddard's and making decisions. And I worked closely with Simon. Milford and Sebastian Archbold on the technical side to make sure that we had all those pieces in place and it just worked. It was just so magical. It was sort of amazing. Um, <laughs> let's see. Um, yeah, I don't know what, what's going on with you, Mike Mac, but, uh, McCartney, but, uh, mm. as always, always late to the show. So, how about give him a I'm, card? Give him a card. <laughs> well, somebody's got to. Somebody's got to. Okay, I'm I'm gonna run the, run the title sequence because I think it's probably a good time. Where um, yes, and he's very happy to see familiar faces on the screen. Maybe it's time that we can just maybe spend a couple seconds talking about the other reason that we were there, other than the. Uh, the the EHCO uh, Tristan here just saying it's lovely to hear the wider third team really helped make a difference. It really it really did. It was everything. And so I am going to take this into all the future tournaments I work with, and I am going to try to change the way that we ordinarily set things up, especially on the international level. How segregated the two teams are, it's dumb. It's just so unnecessary, and I'm just I'm not going to stand for it anymore. I'm going to do my typical Keeley thing and come bashing through the wall and go, oh yeah, and you know, rec, rec shop and try to change that because it meant we had a much better tournament as a result. So there you go. Oh, wait, um, <laughs> let's say we can't be, uh, nah, I don't know, Mike, everybody else arrived on time. Um, Keely, just one other thing briefly. Yeah. Is not to overlook the fact that the, MO team, a lot of them are actually umpires. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to engage so they could learn as well. So it wasn't just them doing their MO stuff. It was actually that they're learning the same things that we're all talking about in terms of what's going on on the pitch and umpiring was. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. And, and that's really true on the international scene as well. And one of the problems with not being, not having those close relationships with technical folks is that we forget and we don't learn about people's hockey pasts. And a lot of match officials at that level, most of them, in fact, have been high level umpires or still are. And we, we treat them like a, di a whole different species of hockey volunteer. And that's just, that's ridiculous. So uh, I'm really glad that we had this opportunity. And Luke, um, don't, you're not wide at all. 
the only person who's wide here is, I can't, I can't even bring the comment up on the screen. The only person who's wide is the gentleman who had that on the back of his shirt. So there you go. Mike still is sitting there, not. He's pretending that I didn't make a comment. Okay, so I'm going to run the title and let's see if this works. Um, let's talk about, oh boy, this is, this is, this is struggle bus here. I'll try it this way. Huh. Let's talk about our impressions of the EHL as much as we were able to, to take it in. Um, what did you, what did you learn about, uh, how that whole event is put on and, and how the umpires at that level are operating? What, what did you learn there, everybody? Maybe start with Kat. Well, um, I found the thing that stood out the most to me was uh, the positioning situation. Um, I, 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 I had been watching a lot of EHCO um, games and I, I can only really recall the EHL games that I watched after, like in between the EHCO. Uh, despite having been there for the first game before that, but uh, I like I watched uh, Mike in the first game um, and and Anwar and Mike was really doing MCP so mission critical positioning uh, really 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 well uh, to the T textbook um, quite far in field and um, I really wanted to try it and I was super excited about it. But then I was watching EHL and I could see that there were still uh, a couple of these really great umpires that were still. Um, hugging the sideline, uh, so to speak. Um, and I, I found, I found it interesting how calls were being made and, and, and I found, um, the differences and I, I sort of tested it out for myself in my own first two matches. And, and I, I was just, it made me even more excited about what MCP could do for high level hockey at an EHL level. So, um, I guess what I took away was. I was just excited to see that some some umpires were doing um, uh, positioning similar to to what we're all trying to to achieve uh, with MCP, and and others weren't. And um, I could see the difference, and I'm hoping that everyone sort of leans towards MCP eventually. But yeah, that's what I took away. I, I thought it was very interesting um, to see the differences, uh, to see uh, what areas of the field were being focused on, and um, you know, areas of responsibility, so to speak, uh, weren't the usual old school um, areas of responsibility and um, just how much how much more as a team you can work um, when when using MCP. So, yeah. Very cool. Godders, you and I had a conversation about old school and I don't know if you remember just exactly how profoundly you blew my mind but I want you to tell it from your perspective because honestly, it it has changed a whole bunch for me. That, uh, and, and I'll talk about that. But but we, we we had that chat about where old school positioning came from. Can you t t tell everybody about that? And and yeah. Yeah. Well, Just... well what, um, and it is an interesting point that Cat raises because some of the some of the guys do it or get some of the um, but male and female umpires do it some of the time and not all of the time. Some of them um, will stay with what they've always done and, they've got, and they're relying on speed, etc., etc., to get to a position. They've also, maybe in a way, they've got the benefit of um, a referral that gets them out of jail from time to time because it was noticeable how some of them did get pinned out into the, the corner flag and have to really leg it. And, and even Lorraine, who's massively fast occasionally was got caught in that area as well but my take on it which is when we discussed it and maybe the light bulb came on was that i'm so bloody old that um when i first started umpiring we had offside and when you have offside you had to stay wide and level with the last defender so you couldn't go and stand inside the field 10 15 yards deeper than the last defender um, because we wouldn't have been able to, to judge offside. So that's where it all came from. Um, you're out there and then you, you have to go around the outside because you're, you're level with the last player and you've got to not get in the way of the inside right channel. So that's where it historically has come from, undoubtedly. Um, and it, yep. and it's, 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 
continues to be coached even now. Um, so, which, which is disappointing, really, because we can all see the benefits of um, an alternative view. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that I obsessed about over the last few days that I was trying to rest and not doing a very good job of it was that conversation, Goddard's, and how all of a sudden everything clicked because it just didn't make sense to me. Like I, I kept thinking and doubting myself, there has to be some merit to this outside old school European J-hook position. There has to be, there has to be a reason that it still serves something in this game because otherwise why, like, where did it come from? How did it happen? And then when you talked about offside, everything fell into place. And I, I gotta say, I am absolutely done with playing small with Mission Critical. And I will tell everybody, I didn't make it up. It was taught to me. I wish I remember who exactly told me about it and who coached me to do it in back in sort of 2014. But I am no longer pretending that maybe there are other options because it, it just watching all of you on the pitch doing things so much better and not having video referral to fall back on. I mean, I'm done with it. I'm not tolerating it anymore. We don't have offside anymore and we are not football referees. And it, it's, it's, it, it's over. It's time for us to jump up and get in line with the modern game. We don't want the players to be looking at us and saying, look how far behind they are. They can't make correct calls. They don't know what they're doing. They don't innovate. They don't try new things. This is it. This is our time to get up to speed and do our jobs better. Mike, do you have anything to follow up with that? Actually, <laughs> What's it yeah, like from to the, do MCP the... so well? <laughs> oh, you want me to talk specifically about MCP or about the No, EHL no, you can general? talk about anything. You can do whatever you want to, but I think I think was what was really watching the EHL was not just the games, but how the umpires treated their prep for the games. So they were very, you know, there were quite a few occasions where you and Kat were in the media area and you were chatting with maybe the umpire, the umpiring pair for the next game. And they were all like super chilled and they'd obviously met up early enough and they'd had the conversation about, you know, what they were going to do a little bit. And then they would go down in plenty of time to get changed and probably continue that conversation. And then they got out on the pitch and it was all, at a really nice casual pace and they were all super chilled and it meant that they were in a good frame of mind to go out and deal with the two teams and enable that really good game of hockey. I think sometimes we don't give ourselves enough time and we're like, yeah, I can do this. Yeah, I know what I'm, I'm, I need to do. Like, yeah, we'll have like a five minute chat about some pre-match stuff while I'm getting dressed, while I'm, you know, snacking on something because I haven't eaten yet properly or whatever and then 10 minutes to go before the game you sort of running on them going right we need to get a toss ready and actually the EHL obviously that's all managed properly and and there's very strict timings on things and in the EHCO that was sort of similar like we had a replicated situation where there were very defined timings to do things and it meant that you could be super chilled before the match and go into it, knowing things were going to happen and we probably can't replicate that every, every single match at the weekend but where matches get potentially more important at tournaments I think taking that on board and seeing them those umpires in that environment and how relaxed they were before the matches really is something that we need to try and replicate yeah no that's a great point and I'm I'm hearing you talking about the professionalism at that level and and yeah. how everything is is pre-planned and contingencies are given allowances for if if you know the car breaks down on the way to the pitch if you know something happens they've got all these buffers built in they've done their pre-match talk you know hours beforehand maybe even the the night before and they've they've packed their bag three times they've they've done all these things they've got their little medical niggles all looked after and they're just they're they've given themselves they put themselves in the opportunity or, or in the position to succeed from their preparation so that is is really nice and there we go <laughs> jenny's on board she's like this is our time for mcp yeah let's go air horn okay <laughs> good stuff yeah, 
I've got one more observation, which is the difference between, um, and it probably doesn't service as well for the people that are moving up through the ladder is, um, there's the, 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 the umpires in the EHL gave a lot more latitude to the players, I think, in terms of not seizing opportunities to set out standards in some, not all of them, but some of them. Um, and it's a, a little bit more, well, you know, and they're known to the players and all the rest of it. And that wasn't quite, you know, that wasn't quite that bad or that's just a competition for the ball. And a lot of it was very much in the situation where we would probably be saying to someone, get on that, deal with that. And it's noticeable, and you you see that a lot. Don't you? the international game or the very high level club game stuff? We take all our examples from that back into our own games. We have yeah. to be that little bit more um, strict, probably not the right word, but but on it and set out the messages much stronger. Yep, absolutely, great points. All right, well let's let's see if this scene change work change works. I. I, I have no no guarantees it's going to work, but here's a treat for all of us. We have a little clip that we're going to roll back that will take us back into European club history. And I want you three and obviously everybody who's watching the stream to participate as we usually do in talking about this clip. Oh, it's actually working. This is from 2001, friends, when they called it the Europa Cup. So hopefully you three can see this just nicely. This is Blumendahl and Harvest Hooter playing. Hey, there's Leandro. Yes, that is Leandro Martinez <laughs> on the tackle. <laughs> Wow. This is amazing. So he sends this video to me last night. And look who's umpiring everybody. We'll be able to see it as it as it comes through. None other than Andy Mayer. Yeah. So I'll I'll show the replay a few times and and we can work through it, but uh it was just such an elegant little um parallel. I don't know, this isn't going to work at all. I was going to show a picture of myself and I showed this to Leandro and let's see if I can get it to come up here. Um, he, this is from 2003 and you'll see a rather unfortunately brunette colored um, individual in the front row and then Andy Mayer in the back. And so I sent this to Leandro and said, yeah, Andy Mayer is my friend and he's the one who gave you that yellow card in that situation for that sliding tackle. So let's talk about this a little bit because leandra was convinced that he got the ball cleanly so friends from your observations what 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 are you seeing is like let's work through this the way that i i ordinarily do on these shows what do y'all think D different era for me it's a great tackle yeah. Mike, you can't just say that for say. Leandro. That's not fair. <laughs> yeah, no, I th I think if we're if we're going uh, through <laughs> that era, I, I don't even know. I, you know, that wasn't my era. I don't think I was born then. No, I'm, I'm joking. Um, but yeah, I think you know, clean, yeah, clean tackle at the time. Uh, now it would be a, a ten minute yellow. Um, but uh, back then, uh, no yellow card necessary. He did a great job. No, Andy gave a yellow card, you guys. You guys are going the wrong way with this. <laughs> Goddard's, come on, rescue this situation for me. Well, at the time, we would definitely not have had a prescriptive, you take someone to ground, sliding. It would have been purely dealt with on terms of breakdown, stroke danger, um, as opposed to that, because I don't think that was prescriptively within the uh, rules, regulations. Um, it's hard to tell from that angle, to be brutally honest, but um, I can see where, where he's come from with the yellow card myself. Um, yeah, which, absolutely. Which I, can't quite, I can't quite see whether he's hit the stick before the ball, but from where he's gone, he's gone very high risk. And if he doesn't get it right and Andy's got a better view than us, then I think outside the 23, the outcome would undoubtedly have had to have been the, the yellow card. 
Has anybody looked at the right hand? Yeah, there's a there's a there's a in over the top with the right hand. Yeah. I couldn't tell whether he touched, but yeah. Looks like he yeah, might have pushed and, into the and obviously the resolution is terrible, the frame rates are terrible, this is 2001 and ripped it off YouTube, and Andy's view of this is gonna be very different. But for me, I see enough contact that it doesn't surprise me that an umpire on the pitch would award a yellow card in this situation because regardless of whether a player gets a ball in this situation, they cannot they cannot commit a tackle through which they make body contact as well. And that body contact in this case brought the player to ground. So for me, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm backing up Andy on this one all the way. I really admire the, the, the skill and the diligence at which, you know, Leandro attempted to, to grab this ball. But th this is exactly, I mean, yeah, these days this would be absolutely a, a 10 minute yellow every time because we're trying to get these diving tackles that take players to ground completely out of the game. And I don't know, kudos to Andy for for being maybe ahead of the time. Who, who knows? Mike could see the technique here as we it this to have been one of his tackles, um, undoubtedly. So that's why he's got. Oh, 100%. Bit. Yeah, I can yeah. see that. There you go. And there, no, here's that's, Alan. That's sorry, here's Alan Dow in the comments here saying he had the pleasure of umpiring with Andy Mayer uh, on an over 40 ladies match the other day. And um, McCartney pointing out that the the TV folk at the EHL, and I, I told this to Leandro in our chat, I said, hey, did you know that Andy was f taking photographs at EHL? And it's one of his hobbies that he loves to do to continue to support and give back to the game. Uh, that he was there. So the circle of all these things is just amazing. And uh, that he kept being brought up on the TV and giving props. And Jenny saw it. Jenny saw the hand on the player. So there you go. Um, what does Luke have to say? still has that wooden stick. I don't know. I don't know. And I want to hear the whole story about how a player from Spain ends up playing for Harvest Tutor and ends up in the final and and Leander did say he was so extremely proud to make the final of this event and when you see you know it, it takes you back to the humanity of of the players and how much passion that they have for the game and how much they had invested and now he's bringing that as an administrator to promote club hockey in Europe it's that important to him and that he's you know he's he's got his his tribe of, of friends around him who feel the same way and who are who are supporting European club hockey and I think that's yeah that's amazing Luke here what's he saying um let's see trying to bring it up for Luke Dock and it looks like he got the ball but the recklessness to bring the other player down the ground is still pretty high got the ball maybe but still a yellow card for danger and it's yeah it's for the physical contact it's yeah it's pretty clear Leandro Love you to death. And I hope this doesn't mean you won't invite us back to EHO next year, EHCO. <laughs> <laughs> so that would just that would just serve me right, wouldn't it? Oh, it's tough being honest. Okay, I have one more clip for you guys. Are you, are you okay with sticking around for one more? Hopefully yeah, it won't yeah. take too long. Okay, but this that actually came from, and this was, I think Ben posted this in the server, and this was an aerial... Uh, free hit that led to a goal. So let's have a look at this one here. That's a goal. That's a goal. That's a goal. He's allowed. Do it. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, this, I, I think it's going to be an umpire's own referral. Uh, can you please check if the ball was touched by a road class player in the D? I will check the situation. Yeah, you were the goal and it's an umpire uh, referral just to be sure. My own referral. Okay. So the overhead ball is thrown. The umpire is happy that the defenders are five. So there's no problem with that. That takes a touch of a hamburger stick and then comes in. Does Timo Oruz get a touch on this? 
because that's a hamburger stick, so that would be a long corner. But if Timo Oruz gets a touch, this is a goal. I need a wider angle. I need to see if it touched the, the first uh, defender, touched the ball inside the D. Wide angle, please, from the start. I need to see if the first defender... Yeah, thank you. You don't see many goals like this one, Sam, do you? This is unusual. So the first defender does touch it. That is a touch because that changes the angle and the pace. And then as it drops okay, down... Yeah, decision coming. So it's a deflection. So it's not th that's not about five meters. You don't have to give five meters about Sam, danger. I have an I advice for you. You may run a free... I'm cutting it off because I want to hear what you guys have to say <laughs> before we hear what Lorraine says. So what do y'all think? Okay. We saw this live. So the first question we had was, was the uh, defender five from where that was taken? But assuming mm -hmm. he was, then the ball gone directly into the circle. So the outcome would be a free hit for the defence with the ball going directly into the circle from the restart. Yeah. Yeah, for me but too. If he's if he's the ball's the inside the dashes. Yeah. The ball's so inside the dashes. Five. If the defender's five meters, then the touch has to be inside the circle, and therefore the ball's gone straight into the circle. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the that was my first impression um when 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 I first well. Yeah, and and I mean Stain's bringing up that um the the uh, receiving area may have been crowded and the initial receiver, blah, 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 you know, couldn't be established. But if a ball can be legally played at any point as an aerial is traversing over the circle, then that is straight into the circle. And so I don't know where anybody else went on this. Lorene pegged it, you know, absolutely that and, and the fact is that the she wanted to establish and make sure that the defender was inside the circle because if the defender had touched it outside the circle, that would negate the straight into the circle rule, right? So she was like, can you show me where the first defender touched the ball? And as soon as the defender, and I don't know if he did this intentionally, but he definitely kind of, instead of pressing forward to reach for the ball, he actually kind of slanted back a little bit to get a stick on it and that showed very clearly that the ball could be legally played inside the circle therefore that ball went straight into the circle and yeah it was just straight there there you go rachel's on top of it bless oh. sorry um Keith. bless his cotton socks but it's another example where you don't take all your umpiring lessons from simon mason as well <laughs> I didn't want to say it, but I was like, Mace, where, where well, are you I going can, with this? <laughs> That's a goal. That's a goal. Yeah, and and they didn't pick up on the straight into the circle part. They were they were concerned with who touched the ball, you know, in front of the goal. And you know, it, it yeah, it was just a little bit surprising to me that that didn't really get picked up on that. What's Mike McCartney saying here? On the subject of giving cards, happy to report that on properly unpacking his bag when he got back home, he found them. Good for you, Mike. Good for you. I can't wait to hear you put them to use. There you go. Um, let's see. Here's Fraser. If this, if the defender was outside the circle, does it change the decision? Okay. So um, for me, and, and please jump in if you think I'm, I'm on drugs on this one, but... The, the things that we have to consider is, first of all, that the defender does have to be five meters away. And from where Ruhr is taking this free hit, he is on the dashes, pretty much. So he wouldn't be able to be uh, any closer. So every little free hit decision has its own fact situation that you can't really change or manipulate. But let's say that ball had started uh, earlier. And yes, if that defender had touched the ball outside the circle that negates the free hit rules of going straight in so that's where you the question for me is if the defender's not five and touches it just outside the circle are you brave enough to play the advantage on the falling ball for the forward <laughs> or are you calling a penalty corner and giving a card for the breakdown as soon as he touches it yeah, yeah. oh who knows right who knows uh jolt um <laughs> drive by likes button smash replay squad thanks jolt i appreciate that 
Um, let's see. Or is there any way this wasn't a defensive ball? Um, not the way it turned out. No, <laughs> this was absolutely a, a free hit for the defense. There you go. Oh, snap. And let's see. Even if that was a legal aerial, says Mike McCartney, both defender and attacker well within five meters of each other. So free hit for danger as it's coming down. And and again, I, I don't want to hinge these calls. And I get very picky about language, as you all know, but... It's not necessarily that the two players are within five meters of each other. It's that they're within playing distance and they're close to each other vis-a-vis -vis the way that the ball is coming towards them, that they are both in, like, it is a dangerous situation. It's not that one of them was in front of the other, and because of the trajectory of the ball, they were safely the initial receiver, and the, the player that was within five but behind them wasn't in danger. Like, that... They, they are right at the same level, basically, as that ball's coming in. So, yeah, it's, you know, it's unsafely. And it's it's a weird, like, I, I don't even understand why an international player would attempt this. And I, I don't know if it's because it got touched that the ball was intended to go over the circle. But I don't know if there was a player, like... Was there even an attacker? There oh, yeah, no there was an attacker on the other side. Oh, yeah, there is. Yeah, there was. There He's was. Yeah, there so maybe one. that was the... That was the intention. My other question... My other question, Keely, I think is... It would be interesting to know what the two umpires were talking about when that when that ball's gone off, because it doesn't seem to cross Seb's mind that that could have been a straight. Yeah. And I can't remember who his colleague was, but... Um, yeah, I don't You think between that. them... Right in between the, but I don't know. But, you know, it yeah, seems pretty obvious. Yeah, and I, I think that's a real difference that we're, it, it's a little bit of a disservice the way that things carry out at the level that they have the video referral at because we don't, it, it, they have a very different approach to those situations where there actually is a little bit less cooperation between the two umpires because they know they have a third umpire that they can rely on. And they can use. And sometimes I think there's, uh, from my conversations with some umpires at this level, they, they don't think that they should be stepping in because there is this third person who has a different view, who can watch it on replay several times and frame by frame and all that kind of thing, that they should just stay out of it. And we're seeing evidence of that with the way that some um, umpires are taking a supporting position on penalty corners that isn't the best place necessarily to help with the two decisions that we without video referral would always prioritize, which is whether the shots on net and whether it hits the, uh, the defender who's running out above uh, on the knee or above the knee. So they're, they're taking a more exterior position because they're worried about getting caught on the turnover. So it's a really interesting, um, sort of thing. Um, let's and see. there were quite a lot of things, weren't there, where the, there was no advice possible with the ball hitting the runner out because the camera, where they, maybe you should say the, the um, supporting umpire is a little offset and isn't really um, available to make a decision. Yeah, it's it's risky. It's risky to, to, to rely on that. And I, I wonder if the w with more no advice possibles and maybe the technology not quite working out that there might be an adjustment in practice and philosophy in applying that, the people are going to start saying, okay, maybe we need to keep that supporting umpire a bit more engaged in assisting on those, those decisions. But it's kind of for us at home to realize, okay, we don't have that luxury. So how do we step in and communicate and support our colleague in getting to the right decision here? And, you know, what have we agreed upon in our pre-match chat that we're going to say, Hey, that you've made a, mistake on a fundamental decision very important to the to the game how are we going to handle it how am i going to tell you that we need to have a conversation am i just going to yell at you on the radio are we going to stop time and have a chat where we come together and all that kind of thing so those are the things that we need to be thinking about and not just take the presentation at this level as the way we're going to do it at home for sure so andrew has a question who wants to nail this one if the injector scooped the ball to the top of the D at a penalty corner, would it be a free hit defense? 
Let me get my rule book out. There we go. That's the answer I'm looking for. Get out the rule book. <laughs> oh, I can do that too, except my scenes are all mucked up. So I'm worried about trying to do that. But um, there we go. Yes. I Never seen. <laughs> yes, it would be a free hit defense because of this. As yes. Rachel points out, yes. As 13. Rachel points out, Rachel's found it. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And the the language, Mike, is clear that it doesn't matter how that ball is intentionally raised. It just it can't be intentionally raised by any means. Is that is that what the rule reads for you? It it reads an attacker pushes or hits the ball without intentionally raising it. So a push implies the ball has to stay on the ground, and it's a hit without intentionally raising it. Yeah. There you go. And yeah, Martin is in complete agreement. And you guys, he missed it. <laughs> Leandro's here. <laughs> Good to see you, Leandro. So you take the little the little timeline toggle um, bar button and pull it back about, I don't know, 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, and scroll it back so you can hear what we have to say about your call. <laughs> or don't, because I still want to be friends. <laughs> there you go absolutely rachel's nailing it there you go oh he's on the subway you know getting home okay the good news leandro is that there is a replay that as soon as we end this broadcast which we're about to do in a few minutes that uh you'll be able to watch it all you can watch it on two times speed and you can skip to all the good parts and you can see us commending your amazing attempt <laughs> And he says, okay. There was, there was a there was a question from Andrew earlier, which I think we missed. No regrets, about, he uh, says. About what at Wednesday's helping out with unusual situations. Oh, okay. And yeah, let's let's cover that just, off um before we go. And if I can find the question, I'll bring it back up again. But yeah, go ahead. So I, I think yes. Um I don't think of any particularly unusual situations off the top of my head, but certainly um Certainly, what at Wednesdays do really help. Uh, what at Wednesdays, the whole Discord server talking through decisions, looking at video, mean that you are not having to think through as many decisions in the moment, and you can act more on instinct. And I think that's a that's a testament to the way that Keeley tries to get us all to think about umpiring and think about decision making that allows us to be instinctual in the moment and come up with the right decisions and not than having to blow for a decision and then think about have i got have i definitely got that right have i got it wrong and you can sort of compartmentalize dealing with the game and then discussing interpretations and decisions afterwards because you can be fairly confident that the base knowledge of working through videos having the conversations about what we do the clips that we see on what a wednesday coming into the discord and talking through decisions that you've made or decisions that other people have made allows that instinctual decision making and then you just you debrief after the match rather than second guessing and there was a question recently about how do you carry on from making a decision that you think might be incorrect or that you're not sure about or there's been a big player reaction to and and having that base knowledge of knowing that your instincts are right more often than not allows you to move on to the next decision and go what's the next decision right i've made it yes now i'm back in the groove and i'm carrying on and we'll talk about the thing that i might have got wrong or that i might not have got completely right after the match rather than dwelling on it so yeah what is a massive massive help to uh to to all our umpiring and i'm sure that goddess and cat will echo that as well yeah the one that i really remember from not that far back was around the um the awarding of a bully at the end of um, well, the last penalty corner and those circumstances that Sir Matt got everybody really thinking, getting into good processes, I think, to your point about having a process and having a clear understanding so it's not um, something you have to go, oh, uh, 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 what am I going to do next? You've actually, we worked it all through, all those situations um, about what we're going to do on the real ward, etc. And that you, can, you can't, you can't have a bully. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. That was yeah, that, that was, was a really, really good one. Yeah, it was. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I, I think I learned the most uh, about aerials. So for me, What Up Wednesday made a huge difference with, with how I interpreted aerials. Um, so yes, I mean, if if um, this wasn't a great example and just, you know, our testament for it, I mean, like, for example, Jakub Boerte, who was on our, on, on your guest on, on a previous uh, stream, I mean, he's a perfect example of what What Up Wednesday can do. So. Um, for those of you who don't know, Jakub Boerte is a, a, an um, a, a new umpire from South Africa who's been involved in hockey for a long time and, and decided to get into umpiring and uh, went to his first uh, interprovincial tournament and got uh, was appointed to the final. Um, and he said that he, he binge watched um, What Up Wednesdays uh, in preparation for this because uh, he was very nervous and so on. And I think that... Uh, I mean, if, if that isn't the perfect example of, of what a Wednesday can of what what a Wednesday can do for you as an umpire, then I don't know what is. You know how uncomfortable it is for me to sit here and you you all being nice to me. I, yeah, we'll I, be giving I'm you like, some of your own medicine. Oh, it's the worst. <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot easier when Goddard is just making fun of me. Yeah, exactly. Right there, you go. Um, and McCartney chiming in here. He's saying that. Uh, the, the, the What Up Wednesday and Discord examples are helpful because you can think about the more unusual but possible things that can happen on a pitch and train your brain to react the right way. And that's that's exactly what what I'm trying to do. I God, I only wish I'd had the opportunities to do all this, you know, kind of work back in the day. And I mean, I was part of a forum that uh, I joined in 2006 when I first went over to England. And that's how I met a whole bunch of people in the MPUA before I got there, but you know, we, we would have long discussions and I got very practiced at having arguments with people who didn't want to use logic very much in their umpiring <laughs> and how important choice of language was in order to try to apply the interpretations most effectively and, and stay true to the spirit of the game, the way that, you know, we all understand it and the way that we want it. So, so that was, that was really great. And of course, the <laughs> wrapping up comment, I think. All in all, let's restart with a bully. There you go. We are going to, we, we're definitely going to, oh, he's got a shirt on. <laughs> Goddard, you gem. You utter legend, you. I didn't even notice. That is so amazing. Yeah, we're going to put those shirts up on sale for everybody. You won't have your tour name on the back unless, you know, we can arrange it, but yeah it's it's a it's a good slogan it's a good shirt great to have. design i think great design yes cat great design cat cat got that done any closing thoughts from you guys uh, <laughs> in wrapping up this what up wednesday this was really awesome anything you want to impart upon the 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 viewers at home your fellow third team members just, just for you um like I, I said all the thank yous at EHCO, but uh, thank you again for everything you do um, with FHU and, uh, you know, like I, I I was making a video today for, for my university application and I think half of it is about FHU and how, you know, I really want to, you know, help out and, and, and be a part of it for as long as I can. And yeah, so thank you for, for everything you've done and, and for all the help that you've given me. I mean, I, I couldn't picture my umpiring career being the way that it is without you. So thank you. You're very welcome. There you go. Martin has found his tour shirt. That's the good news. For me, Keely, what That's was fine. really interesting was that we're, we're basically doing all this stuff online. Yet we came together and the, the community that was created and the consistency of view and, and, and attitudes and all the rest of it just shows what a great community how well it works. And you could take everybody, all the people here tonight, and get them to the next one, and we'd have an even bigger party. It'd be great fun. Because um, the message is so clear, I think that's the thing. Yeah. Awesome. Mike, do you want to wrap it up? Just get involved. It's great fun. It's an absolute blast. Come to the next one. Be there, there or be square. Be there or be square and there will be a next one so get in the server because we're going to have conversations about it and if you know of an event where you think that we would be a great fit for suggest it 
And yeah. our team manager, Kat, will get on top of it and we'll figure out if it's a good if it's a good fit. And of course, thank you for taking us, uh, getting us in the mood with the dancing goddess. That was really awesome. Let's do the World Cup next. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good to me. Let's go. All right. Thanks again, everybody, and have a fantastic hockey week, and we'll see you in the server. <laughs>